Good evening, Prayer House. I'm so glad to join you guys in worship again. My name is Erica, and I hope that you can join me as I lead you in worship this evening from your room or wherever you'll be. Just take a minute to welcome the Holy Spirit into your room, and I'll just pray for all of us wherever we'll be. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to keep worshiping you, even if it's not in the ways that we are used to. I pray that, Lord, even as we worship, that you will come down into everybody's heart, whoever is going to be watching this today, God. I pray that you will speak a special message for the person who's looking at us right now and who's wondering what to do in their lives. I pray that, Lord, the Spirit of God shall visit them in their room right now. And we pray because we might not be seeing what's going on in everybody's life, but you, God, you are everywhere. You are omnipotent. You are omnipresent, God. So we welcome you, God, to take control of this worship, to take control of our time together, oh God.
Uh, prayer house uh, welcome again to a monday night uh, we're very excited to have you here uh, my name is Jean-Michel, and I'll be the one sharing uh, tonight. And uh, before we begin, I'd like uh, for us to pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you, God, that we are here and that we are healthy. And God, we thank you that we can gather together um, one more time, God. Uh, we do not take this for granted. God, I pray as I share of your word, O oh, Father, that uh, you inspire and challenge us. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for any one of you who have been tuning in for the last uh, few weeks, actually the last month, um, Peace has been uh, teaching us uh, a very timely message of you are not alone. And part of what she wanted to remind us is that even in the midst of life's chaos, even in the midst of loneliness and all of that, we still have a God who is present, Emmanuel, God with us. And that even the challenges that we go through, that some of them are due maybe to sin and to some things that we have done, but some of them is God actually pushing us to the edge and to go into deeper waters. And as you have noticed, we're getting to the end of the year. Um, this year has been crazy, and this year has just been, it humbled all of us. And um, sometimes in the middle of all of these issues, it becomes really, really hard for us to remember why we believe what we believe. And what I wanted to do for the next few weeks is to go back to basics and go back to asking ourselves, what do we actually believe as believers? Because in hard times such as these, or even in, in, in good times, we always have to know the reason to why we believe what we believe. It was Paul who told Peter, he said, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you profess it, but do it with a spirit of gentleness. And what I want to do for the next few weeks is to answer some of the questions that I think are very important for us to understand why we believe what we believe. And the first thing, anyone who knows me, a lot of my friends say that one of my favorite words is the word worldview. All of us have a worldview, a lens through which we explain everything that happens to us. Every culture has a worldview. Everyone has a way in which they explain what is happening to them. And in times like these where we are having a lot of uncertainty, it's going to become very important that we are clear about what we believe as Christians and what the Bible actually says. When we look at worldviews, we have to answer four basic questions. The first one is origin. Where do we come from? Where do I come from? The second one is meaning. It's like, what does this life really mean? The third one is morality and how do we differentiate between good and evil? And finally, is destiny. And this is the question of what happens when all of this is done. When a person dies, where do they go? But today, I want to talk to us about origin. You see, the first words of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. There's a few things that Genesis 1 actually explains to us. The first thing that he says is that there was a beginning. When you study the history of thoughts and the history of ideas, you would find that for many years, people used to believe that the universe has always existed. They never believed that the universe actually had a beginning. But it was in the early 20th century that scientists actually came up and said, uh, they came up with something called the Big Bang Theory. And what the Big Bang Theory basically said is that there was an explosion, and out of that explosion is when the universe actually began. To be honest, it would have been easy if they had just read the Bible to believe that actually the universe had the beginning. Because there's two things. Either the universe has always existed or the universe had a beginning. And science and the Bible do agree that the universe had a beginning. But here's the question. When we look at whether the universe um, 
um, had a beginning. Everyone seems to agree with that. But then that takes out a lot of beliefs. But it tells us that the Bible is right when it says that there was a beginning. But what does the Bible actually say about that beginning? And how is that beginning actually connected to the God that we pray to? In John 1, um, John 1 verses 1 to 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him there was not anything made that was made. In Hebrews 11, 3, it says that by faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are, not, that are visible. In Revelation 4, it says, 4.11, it says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So, we can easily deduct that the universe was created by God. But here's a thing that we have to um, look at. The first thing is nothing comes out of nothing. So it means that the universe could not have created itself. When we look at the argument of the Big Bang Theory, or the Big Bang Theory says that um, matter, chance, and space and time were had a beginning. So it means that in order for that to happen, something that is outside of that must have created it. So it means that if, if matter did start at the beginning, then it means that what created it must have been spirit. It's time started at the beginning. Then it means that time, the, the creator of time, was timeless or eternal. And then when we look at all, when we look at all of those attributes, they lead to the attributes of the God of the universe. You see, it will be hard for anyone who is not um, a believer to explain how the universe uh, began. For many of people say that the Big Bang actually uh, discredits God and he says that God does not exist. But the question is, where did these materials, where did time come from if time or if things cannot create their own self? So, According to Keith Ward, he says that space time generates its own dust in the process of its own assembly. He says it is logically impossible for cars to bring about some effect without already being in existence. Between the hypothesis of God and the hypothesis of the cosmic bootstrap, there is no competition. We're always right to think persons of universe who seek to pull themselves out of their own bootstrap are forever doomed to failure. And he says that for sure, nothing is every bit as physical as something, especially if it is to be defined in the absence of something. So what it actually means is that there needs to be an explanation to the universe. And what we as Christians believe is that God is the one who created the universe. It's also very important for us to understand that because when it says that God is the creator of the universe, it means that you and I are not the creators of the universe. The reason to why it's important is because for many years there has been a lot of false teaching, especially Eastern beliefs that tells you that you are the creator of everything, that everything happens because of your thoughts. But actually that opposes what the Bible says. It says that in the beginning God created we might ask ourselves, then what was the purpose of God creating the universe? When we look at Genesis and the Genesis account of how God created the universe in sequence, he says that it implies a purpose in creation. And that purpose is that of having human beings that are made in God's image. When we look at the way in which God created the universe, first he says, let there be light. And then he separated land from the ocean. But all of that, he says that the crown of creation is man. But he says that man is created in the image of God. But he does not say that man is God. In Genesis, we can also notice that there is no step without God speaking. And this is, of course in opposition to those who claim that God is some mindless and unguided uh, spir uh, spiritual being that doesn't um, have any form. But this is what we can see straight from the Genesis. 
It says that God created the heavens and the earth. It says that God sustains everything. All of these things, when we see it, is the glory of God. All of this is God who created. But then God created man. And when God created man, he created man in his own image. In Psalm 8, it says, When I consider the heavens, the moons and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them, that you've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You've given them rulership over the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea. Oh Lord my God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And what the Psalm 8 tells us, it tells us that God created all of these things, but then that God created man, that he created him in his own image. And what that means is that all of us have inherent worth, inherent worth. It means that it's a worth that is not assigned by society. It's a worth that is not dependent on whether we have money, whether we have possessions, whether we have titles and status and all of these things. It's a worth that comes from the fact that we're created in the image of the most beautiful and awesome God. So when we look at the first premise of everything that God, of our faith, is that God is a creator. That God created and God created us. So what are the implications of that? What is the implication of believing that God created the universe? The first thing is understanding that everything has a purpose. That God created not only us for a purpose, but he created the universe and everything around it with a purpose in mind. But secondly, it means that we cannot know that purpose without first knowing and having a relationship with the creator. Why is that important? If I want to know, if I want to, to, if I have a thing like this, it's just a machine that is in front of me. If I want to understand how to use this, I can only understand it once I understand why it was created. So it was first in the mind of whoever created a computer. And he had a purpose behind it. And if we want to use this computer to the best of its abilities, we need to understand the mind of the person who purposed for it to exist. So it's important for us to understand that purpose, purpose cannot come from our job. Purpose cannot come from some gurus or some teachers that we hear from. Purpose comes from the one who created us and he created us in a specific way and he created the universe for life on earth to flourish. And that means that in everything that he's done, Everything that he does, there's a purpose. And that is the same thing for you. So if you're here and you want to understand the basics of Christianity, the first thing is we understand that God created the universe and he created it with a purpose. And God created human beings to live in relationship with him and to cater for all of the earth. And that is why, for example... It is wrong for racism to happen. It is wrong for sexism to happen. It is wrong for all of these different things to happen because they go against the initial purpose of why God created not only the universe, but also us as humans. So in the next few weeks, we're going to continue and we'll look at some other things such as understanding the fall. What is wrong with the world? What is wrong with us as human beings? And... If God knew that there was going to be something wrong, why did he still create us? So let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the creator. You are the one who made all of this happen by your word, by your speech, O oh Lord. God, we thank you that you created us, that you created the universe, that even in times where it doesn't make any sense, can we trust that you know it and you have a purpose behind all of these things. God, for anyone who's here who's listening tonight, I pray, oh Father God, that you reveal the purpose of their life, the purpose to why they're going through whatever they're going through. Give them hope and understand that behind it all, that you are there and you have a purpose for all of these things. 
God, I pray for this week. May you be uh, with us. May you give us courage. And may you give us strength to face these times. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us in our beautiful time of worship. We hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed the sermon. We thank Jean-Michel for sharing the sermon with us and everybody else who is in the background making these videos, the worship team, the band and everybody. Thank you so much for your hard work and for your effort despite this season. So just remember that the prayer house is always on every Monday and you should remember to subscribe right now so that you don't miss the next session on Monday.